So we've looked at translational partition functions, and now we can look at rotational partition functions. And just kind of bottom line up front, it turns out that the uh, rotational partition function is uh, approximately equal to kt over sigma times b. And b is the rotational constant. And uh, notice I'm not using the same rotational constant as Atkins. I'm using h bar squared over 2i. Sigma here is a symmetry number, and uh, let's see if I can spell symmetry. Symmetry has uh, two m's and one t, is that right? And the symmetry number, we're really not going to go into it too much here, but uh, I can give you kind of a little flavor maybe. Uh, a molecule like HCl has a symmetry number of one, and uh, the reason for that is that as you rotate it uh, from uh, 180 degrees one way and then the other, it looks completely different. Uh, but if you take a molecule like hydrogen or a molecule like carbon dioxide, they actually have symmetry numbers of two and the reason for that is that if you rotate them and uh, I can go ahead and I can label these atoms in reality of course we can't label them and if you imagine a uh, rotation about this uh, C2 axis here and uh, you made a 180 degree rotation here it would leave the hydrogens in the opposite position to before uh, but it turns out that they are symmetrical and completely identical and so uh, you really can't distinguish between these two orientations so we have to be a little bit careful and uh, to avoid double counting we're going to divide out by that symmetry number the same with carbon dioxide and so carbon dioxide uh, again as we make uh, I guess the left hand oxygen and the right hand oxygen A versus B and we do that 180 degree rotation we get another state here uh, where we've swapped the oxygens around but uh, because the oxygens are essentially identical we uh, can't distinguish between them and so our symmetry number of two just helps us avoid that double counting. Um, there's a little bit more to it actually we have to actually deal with Pauli statistics but uh, very very roughly you can see the symmetry number is equal to um, the uh, principal rotation axis number. We can derive the partition function expression for rotational energy levels uh, using quite a sneaky trick actually and uh, it's kind of a neat trick because it shows up in a lot of different places so uh, even if you don't end up using partition functions in your future it's possible you might end up using this trick somewhere in your future maybe. So we know the partition function is basically a sum over all the states or we can do it over the levels actually so since uh, we've got a uh, uh, 2j plus 1 degeneracy for the rotational levels it's probably easier to sum over the levels instead of the states so g sub l right so that's our um, our degeneracy so that's 2j plus 1 times by e to the minus the energy of each level j over kt okay and we know that the uh, expression here then can be expanded out and so uh, uh, oops I'm sorry uh, so g sub j is uh, 2j plus 1 Okay, and then e to the minus the energy is, uh, let me see, b, j, j plus 1. So that's why I prefer that, prefer that rotational constant form over Atkins's form, uh, all divided by kt. And uh, we can go ahead and we can do that sum. Now, the sneaky trick I mentioned earlier is uh, something you've possibly seen before. So we're doing a sum. Uh, we could, you can think about it in terms of a sort of a bar chart, right, would be the sum of the areas of these rectangles here. And so each little strip, right, you can add up and uh, bring them together. And uh, the trick here is to recognize that if you've got a function that looks something like that, the sum of all those four strips there is approximately equal to the area under the curve. And the area under the curve we get by differentiating. So if we've got that function and uh, we've got the limits here, a and b, let's say, then we can approximate the area of those strips or those uh, four sums there as the, er as the area under the function, right, the integral. So this is our approximation here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to say that this is approximately equal to the integral. Uh, now we're varying j, so uh, our limits here are going to be j equals 0 and uh, j equals infinity. So j can go all the way up, presumably, uh, although unless we're at infinite temperature, it probably doesn't matter about those infinitely high levels. So uh, what do we have? 2j plus 1 times by e to the minus uh, bj j plus 1 da, 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 over kt and then we're uh, integrating over values of j so we got dj at the end now this expression here you might say well gosh it doesn't seem like a really neat trick because it looks like this expression is super hard uh, but what we can do actually is we can notice that this integral has a quite a simple form and if you remember integration is just anti-differentiation uh, what you might recognize is that if you differentiate 
the exponential function, so the derivative with respect to j of e to the minus b j j plus 1, uh, all divided by kt. Uh, you do a little bit of chain rule, so you take the derivative of the inside function. Uh, so what do we have? We got minus b over kt, those are just constants, we bring them out front. And then if you take j, j plus 1, that's j squared plus j. And the derivative of j squared plus j is 2j plus 1. Ah, so is it looking kind of familiar now? And then uh, we basically take the derivative of the exponential function. Well, e to the power is just e to the power. And so it's e to the power of minus b, uh, well, everything we had before like so. And now if we look at that, we can see that essentially that's what we're asking uh, to do up here. We're trying to integrate this, which is really just asking what would we differentiate to get this. And we can see if we differentiate this function here, we get what we need with this extra minus b over kt term up front. And so if we multiply by the inverse of that, uh, then we can basically uh, get the expression we need. And so I'm going to squeeze this in on the bottom. Actually, I'm going to move everything up. Hold on. I'm just going to move everything up like so. Okay, awesome. And now we can go ahead and we can finish this off. So qr is equal to, uh, so we need um, this function here, right, this part here we need to invert uh, because when we multiply that we need to cancel it. So it would be minus kt over b and then that integral up here now is exactly what we need. Uh, it's this thing down here. So we know that if we differentiate this, uh, we get this times by this extra term here. And so uh, the antiderivative then is the integral. So this thing up here is the answer to our integral. So it's e to the minus b j, j plus 1, all divided by kt. And uh, what do we have here? So we have the limits here. So we've got the limits of j equals 0 and j equals infinity. So uh, we can plug these in, actually. And if we plug these in, we'll see that if we plug in the upper limit, uh, what do we have here? We've got uh, j equals infinity. So we'll have e to the minus uh, infinity. e to the minus infinity is 0. So uh, that makes life easier. And then we subtract our lower limit away. So our lower limit um, it's going to be minus kt over b times by e to the uh, minus 0. So e to the 0 is 1. Um, so that double negative becomes a positive, and that e to the 0 is 1. So that's equal to kt over b. And that's what we saw earlier, actually. So we saw qr is equal to kt over b. And then we kind of put in that fudge factor sigma there. So that represents that symmetry number. The idea that uh, molecules like CO2, you know, when they rotate by 180 degrees, they're actually identical. And so we double count those states unless we divide out by two. If you've got a molecule like ammonia, right, you've got that threefold rotation that would give you a symmetry number of three here and so on. So does this trick work all the time? Well, it turns out that it doesn't actually. It's only really valid. Uh, when kt is bigger than b and much bigger than b. So we got to be a little bit careful here. And uh, sometimes we actually write our expression a little bit different. So our partition function we saw is equal to kt over that symmetry factor there times by b. And sometimes we can kind of focus on this here. We can see that uh, k times by b, and then if we take an unsymmetrical molecule, that's 1, so it just drops out. Uh, k over b actually has uh, dimensions of reciprocal temperature, and so we can uh, imagine ourselves uh, dividing the actual temperature by another temperature, and we typically call it T sub r, that's the rotational temperature. I should probably pop that symmetry factor back in. And uh, T sub r then is just uh, the inverse of k over b, and so that would just be b divided by k. And uh, it's a character characteristic rotational temperature. And so each molecule has its own characteristic rotational temperature. And it turns out that uh, if you have a molecule like hydrogen, uh, hydrogen has this characteristic rotational temperature of 88 Kelvin. And that suggests that as long as we are above 88 Kelvin, then this term, this condition up here will probably be just fine. And hydrogen is actually a worst case scenario. Although it's a very small molecule, uh, we'll see that we have a very large quantum effects. But if you take something like bromine, uh, bromine has a rotational temperature on the order of 10 Kelvin. So really at any temperatures you like, as long as you're not real close to absolute zero, it's probably safe to use this uh, approximate form of the uh, rotational partition function.